Hello, I am Lucy Bremont, Executive Director of Emancipation Park Conservancy. On behalf of the Conservancy, our Board of Directors and staff, I want to welcome you all to our Emancipation Conversations Lecture Series. I have to tell you, I am so excited to have each and every one of you here with us today for this amazing event, especially our very special guest, Mr. Darren Walker with the Ford Foundation. You know, on June 19th, 1865, it is the day that Texas slaves learned they were free, two years after slavery was abolished in the United States. Can you imagine that? Emancipation Park was founded in 1872 by free slaves, the community led by Reverend Jack Yates, Richard Allen, Richard Brock, and Reverend Dibble, collected $800 to purchase 10 acres of land as a space that they could commemorate their freedom, community, economic development, commerce, and property ownership. And today, 149 years later, we're still preserving this historic site for future generations to experience. The Emancipation Park Conservancy is responsible for programming events and fundraising for Emancipation Park. And our focus areas are health and wellness, economic empowerment and education. And today's Economic Conversations lecture series is a part of our educational programming. Our staff is made up of a dynamic group of individuals and we are the very first staff for the Conservancy and our team is made up of Iris Garcia, who is Administrative Assistant, Kanetta Moore, Special Events and Marketing Manager, Petrina Johnson, Development Associate, and Jonathan Howard, who is our Operations Manager. Again, we welcome you, and we're so glad you decided to join us. Next, I'd like to introduce you to our moderator, Ms. Melanie Lawson. Melanie is a proud Houstonian and anchor of Houston's own ABC 13. She has covered virtually every city, state, and national election during her career, and we're so glad that she can add Emancipation Conversations, a fireside chat with Mr. Darren Walker, featuring our very own board chair, Mr. Ramon Manning, to that list. Melanie, take it over. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Emancipation Park. On behalf of the Park Conservancy, I am so excited to be here this afternoon alongside Darren Walker, who is president of the Ford Foundation, and Ramon Manning, who is Emancipation Park Conservancy's board chair. We'll be hearing from both of them in just a moment. But first, let me introduce them briefly. Darren Walker, as I mentioned, is president of the Ford Foundation, a $14 billion international social justice philanthropy. He is a member of the Reimagining New York Commission and co-chair of NYC Census 2020. He chaired the philanthropy committee that brought a resolution to the city of Detroit's historic bankruptcy. And under his leadership, the Ford Foundation became the first nonprofit in American history to issue a $1 billion designated social bond in U.S. capital markets for proceeds to strengthen and stabilize nonprofit organizations in the wake of COVID-19. And we'll be talking about that shortly. Now I want to introduce to you Ramon Manning. He is the founder and CEO of Partners Energy North America, a leading power and natural gas supplier. He is a native Houstonian and he earned his Bachelor of Business Administration degree with a marketing concentration from Texas Southern University. Manning is chairman of the board of the, Ameri of the Emancipation Park Conservancy. He also passionately serves on a number of business and nonprofit boards, including Memorial Hermann Hospital, the Children's Assessment Center, the Houston Municipal Employee Pension System, and the TSU Foundation. Take it away, Ramon. Through the Emancipation Conversations Lecture Series, the Emancipation Park Conservancy will establish a forum that fosters invigorating, inviting, and transformative conversations through interactive lectures. The discussions will feature innovative and iconic community leaders, influencers, and humanitarians across various disciplines, including the arts, literature, business, science, philanthropy, politics, and more. I'd like to take the time to recognize this afternoon's presenting sponsor, Shell. Let's hear a word from Erica Bryant, Vice President, Human Resources, Policy and Benefits. Good afternoon. I'm Erica Bryant, VP of HR Policy and Benefits for the United States. On behalf of Shell, welcome to Emancipation Conversations. 
as Emancipation Park commemorates the 149th anniversary of Juneteenth. This interactive series provides a forum for transformative dialogue, stimulating both reflective thinking and calls to action. Today, we welcome Darren Walker, president of the Ford Foundation to the conversation hosted by Melanie Lawson. Mr. Walker joins the distinguished roster of previous guests, Pulitzer Prize winning author of the 1619 Project, Nicole Hannah-Jones, and award-winning artist, Damian Sneed. All of us stand on the shoulders of those that came before us. It is in honoring that reality that it remains imperative for us to continue to move forward, recommitting to the work that remains still undone. Thank you for joining us as we power progress together. This event would not be possible without your generous donation. Thank you for your continued support of Emancipation Park Conservancy. I'd also like to recognize our event partner, my alma mater, the Texas Southern University. We are grateful for your support as well. Thank you so much and go Tigers. Let's give them both a virtual hand. And you're right, go Tigers. Thank you so much, Ramon. I want to dive right in and give you all a chance to hear from Darren Walker. Uh, and Darren, let me just uh, pose the first question. A lot of people, certainly in our audience, may not realize that you grew up in Texas. In fact, uh, less than an hour away from Houston, first in Ames, Texas, and then Baytown. You said you grew up in a shotgun house with your mom. Talk a little bit about your childhood, and despite the fact that you grew up in what was then a segregated uh, town, why did you feel like your country was cheering you on, especially when you started school? Well, thank you so much, Mel and Ramon. It's a great honor to be with you. The Emancipation Park Conservancy's work is critical to the success of Houston, and what you do reverberates far beyond the borders of that great city. I'm blessed because I was born uh, to a mother who loved me unconditionally. And we were not uh, people of means. When I was a little boy, we lived in uh, East Texas. We lived in Liberty County. I found it ironic that the city, the town uh, was Liberty, but black folks back in the 50s and 60s couldn't live in the town of Liberty. We lived down Highway 90 in Ames, Texas, population 1,200. We lived uh, off one of the FM roads um, in a little shotgun house. And that was where in 1965, a lady approached us and told my mother about a new program that President Johnson was starting that summer. The program was called Head Start. And I was lucky enough to be in the first class of Head Start in the summer of 1965. And that's why I say, Mel, that my country was cheering me on, because at that time, um, the investments that were made in the human potential of young boys and girls, black, brown, white, poor, urban and rural, was unprecedented and targeted to ensure that we had a head start in our education and could get on the mobility escalator and ride that escalator as far as our ambition took us. And that's what I have done and have been incredibly fortunate to be here in New York at the Ford Foundation today. I love the idea of the mobility escalator. That's a, a great analogy. Uh, I should mention you went through public schools. You went on to the University of Texas, uh, both undergrad and then law school. And you went on a Pell Grant. You actually got financial aid. Why do you think that was so significant in your life? It was significant because it reminds me, because today I live with privilege. I live with a lot of privilege. Like a lot of black folks we know who were lucky enough to be in the first generation. All of us, uh, so many of us, are first generation. We are uh, the affirmative action generation. And I proudly say that because America needed and continues to need affirmative action to address the systemic issues of racism and exclusion. And for me today, while I live with privilege, it is important to remember what it is like to not live with privilege. 
I don't worry about the things that my mother worried about, whether or not she could pay the rent, whether her car was going to be repossessed, whether she would be able to have the money so that we could do extracurricular activities. These are the things that most Americans and most black folks continue to wrestle with on a daily, weekly basis. And so while those worries may not be my worries, my lived experience remains with me. And being grounded in that experience and not being uh, intoxicated by my privilege and by all of the trappings that come with that and life in a place like New York City, it's easy to forget if we allow that to happen. None of us can do that. Too many people gave blood, gave their lives so that we could live with the privilege we live with today. Well, and I know that that has uh, been such a big part of your life and certainly uh, as head of a nonprofit. But I want to go just a little bit further uh, back. You started off at a big Wall Street law firm, uh, Cleary Gottlieb, went on to an investment firm, and you were making crazy money at the time, certainly as we uh, compare it now. So why did you walk away from all of that after only seven or eight years? Well, I found myself after a decade on Wall Street feeling uh, that my purpose was accomplished. I wanted to have some semblance of financial security, but what I really wanted and desperately needed was to be working with a purpose and a mission, which quite frankly, uh, working on the trading floor of a big international bank, I did not feel. I was fortunate to meet the Reverend Calvin Butts III at the Abyssinian Baptist Church, and this was the early 1990s. He told me about his plans in starting a development corporation there with Karen Phillips, who was a member of the church. And they uh, invited me to join them on that journey. Uh, it's hard today if you've been to Harlem with the Whole Foods, the Starbucks, the H&M, and all the things on 125th Street, the re revitalized Apollo Theater, to remember that 25 years ago, a lot of folks had left Harlem for dead. And uh, but the Abyssinian church and you know this from your family and your father's leadership, that church meant something in the Harlem community. And it remains to this day a key institution. At that time, Reverend Butts had a vision. Uh, there were literally thousands of units of vacant uh, apartments, uh, brownstones um, that basically the city owned. And he had a plan to revitalize much of that, to bring uh, a supermarket to 125th Street. Hard to believe Central Harlem had more people than Atlanta, and there wasn't a supermarket in our community. So I joined and was fortunate enough to then find my calling. For the first time in my life, I found that I could bring my avocation, what I love doing in community work, with my vocation. And most people, those things are separate. But that's what I found working in Harlem for eight years in that basement office at the Abyssinian Church, doing uh, literally over a thousand units of affordable housing, um, bringing the first supermarket uh, back to Harlem in 50 years, uh, the first uh, community-based uh, developed, uh, design developed and constructed school. Um, it's so it was a, an amazing experience. It reminded me of the centrality uh, and importance of the black church in our community. It remains to this day. I know you said that uh, you had a real sense of urgency when you worked at Abyssinian because there was always somebody standing outside the door who needed help. How difficult a transition was it for you to go from there to the Rockefeller Foundation and ultimately the Ford Foundation? Well, it was a, a transition, most certainly, because when you're working in the community, when you're working in a black community, a community that has a significant population of low-income people, you're dealing with families who are often in crisis, who are dealing with very serious daily crises. And the thing that I learned in that experience was you have to meet people where they are. It is easy for us comfortable, middle class, whatever, to look at a poor person, to look at a person and say, 
look at the situation they're in. Why don't they blah, blah, blah? Well, you need to meet them where they are. Um, and that was one of the lessons I learned. So when I went to the Rockefeller Foundation, all of a sudden I'm working at an institution where, where while the work is important, it doesn't feel urgent to many people who are there. It feels like, um, it feels slightly academic. Uh, and again, as you said, I'm working in Harlem. People are lined up every day for their housing, lined up to get their kids in the Head Start school. Um, and all of the things that people need, folk on a daily basis need, all of a sudden you're going to this quasi-academic environment. You're the only African-American in a senior position. Um, and it's definitely uh, a different experience to go from an all-black organization and church to this very secular, uh, white, elitist kind of institution. Uh, it was a big transition for me. But fortunately, when I came to the Ford Foundation, I really felt like I was coming home in some way. This institution has such a long and rich history with, uh, with social justice. The Ford Foundation helped to create the Head Start program that I was in the inaugural class of. Um, the foundation created the Community Development Corporation movement. Uh, I worked for the Abyssinian Community Development Corporation. Uh, the Ford Foundation experimented with the Pell Grant program. Uh, the Ford Foundation, when Dr. King was uh, murdered, he was on a Ford Foundation um, grant that he and a group of ministers had received from the foundation to do nonviolent training that he wanted to do uh, with, with church uh, leaders and lay leaders. So this foundation has a long and rich history and so when I came to the Ford Foundation, in some ways it was like coming home. Yeah, it really was a full circle moment, I'm sure, for you. Um, but the interesting thing was you walked into the Ford Foundation, as you mentioned, one of the largest and oldest foundations in the country, uh, and you changed things. You really changed how uh, the mission of the Ford Foundation might be. Talk a little bit about that and why you felt it was so important to go from tokenism to transformation. Well, I feel like uh, the Ford Foundation's mission in part is to strengthen democracy in America and around the world. And we had to look at the challenges to that mission. And as we surveyed people, experts, community folk, what we found was people are increasingly hopeless. People are increasingly feeling disconnected, in part because of growing inequality in American society and the world, but certainly the, the inequality that we see, the economic inequality, the inequality um, between outcomes for different races and communities and geographies. And so the trend of inequality was identified as the central threat to our objective of having a strong democracy. And so that inequality, whether it be racial, economic, gender, et cetera. So we, for the first time, organized ourselves around a single mission, and that is addressing the challenge of inequality because we believe that uh, the most important ingredient for a successful America, a successful democracy, is that we are a hopeful America, that people still have hope. In fact, hope is the oxygen of democracy. And hopelessness is our threat. Hopelessness is the threat. The other threat to democracy that I articulated, which was painful for some to hear and remains a challenge to discuss, is the enduring legacy of white supremacy and how that legacy, as painful, as regrettable, and deeply difficult for us to discuss as Americans, has to be acknowledged as a remaining feature of our culture, of our education system, 
of our criminal justice system, and of our economy. And unless we are willing to acknowledge that, we are not going to be able to fully address the opportunity gap, the opportunity gap, whether it be in our justice system or in our economy, for all Americans. We believe that every American deserves to be able to dream and they should have the opportunity to pursue those dreams unfettered of the historic bias and discrimination that for too long has persisted in our country. How difficult was it to sell that to the top 1%, which is who you're dealing with, the, the most privileged, and especially when you were saying things like, instead of giving all of our money to more established organizations, I'm interested in giving more to community-based organizations. Well, I think for us, among the changes was that we began to look at our grant making through an equity lens. And so when you take, for example, the arts program that we have, um, the arts organizations who receive the lion's share of arts funding from foundations and philanthropy are large, important, critical organizations. So, of course, organizations in Houston, like the Houston Ballet, the Alley Theater, these are important institutions. But what about Project Row House? What about the African American Museum? What about those organizations that serve and support the histories of people who have historically been marginalized? So what our grant making looked like more recently, we announced a major program of $100 million of grants in the arts. And for example, in New York, Lincoln Center got $1 million. The Apollo Theater got $7 million. The Whitney Museum received $500,000. The Studio Museum in Harlem received $6.5 million. And if you looked across the country, that uh, dichotomy uh, was, was present, regardless of city. And, and that is because we have used a, a lens of equity. It doesn't mean that we don't like Lincoln Center. I'm on the board of Lincoln Center. I love Lincoln Center. But... The Apollo Theater does not have a hundred plus million dollar endowment like Lincoln Center does. The Apollo Theater doesn't have billionaires populating its board. And so we have to look at things through an equity lens and we have to speak to people who have a very hard time hearing these things. If you are a successful person, particularly if you are a successful person, white man in America today, it is very difficult to hear and internalize that there is something fundamentally unfair because America has worked for you. This economy has worked for you. You are successful in part because of the way it is designed and structured to propel and advance your success. It's very difficult to get people to internalize that because it calls into question some fundamental ideas that we all live with that are not supported by the evidence. Ideas like America is a meritocracy, which is on its face a wonderful aspiration that we should have as a country. But as Michael Sandel at Harvard and many others have shown through hard research, America is not a meritocracy as we would wish it to be. And we need to address and put in place the elements of a society in which true meritocracy were the value that we all shared and lived by. I want to talk about the pandemic because obviously this past year plus we have uh, 
been not only locked in a situation like nothing we've ever seen, certainly a, a, a health crisis like we've never seen, but also the racial reckoning in the wake of the death of uh, Houstonian George Floyd. Do you think that many of uh, the people you work with, corporations, foundations, now have a clearer vision when it comes to systemic racism and poverty, uh, and that they're more willing now to be a part of what you've been talking about all this time, inequality and injustice? I think that there is no doubt that the murder of George Floyd and Ahmaud Aubrey and others that occurred last year and before uh, have informed uh, and jolted uh, the psyche of this country. And, and most definitely, uh, Mr. Floyd's murder did because it was so wanton and willful and because of the courage of that young teenage girl who held her camera up to document the murder of this American citizen by law enforcement. The visual of that was so appalling to so many white people that Racism, systemic racism, deniability was no longer an option. And I think for many white Americans, well-meaning, non-racist, people just wanting to get on with their lives every day, an awareness of racism that it existed was there. But only in the midst of this pandemic and a lockdown when we were confronted with it 24 seven and seeing that nine minutes of the murder of this American citizen by a police officer who was cognizant that he was being videotaped and looked into the camera because he assumed impunity, that that's what appalled so many white Americans and jolted them in to acknowledging the structural racism that exists and the systemic consequences of it. And so we are, I think, Melanie, in a different place than we were a year ago. We've got a long way to go, but I believe as one of my white conservative friends said to me at some point shortly thereafter, the murder, she said, what I saw broke my heart. I think what a lot of white Americans saw was heartbreaking, the visualization of racism. But as I replied to her, black folks' hearts have been broken for over four centuries in this country. And so now, we all can be heartbroken by it, and we all need to commit to eradicating it because deniability is no longer on the table. Uh, ignorance is no longer an option. So well put. You, you chose to do something during the pandemic that was literally unheard of in the world of philanthropy. Uh, talk to me about Project Wanda and your decision uh, that came really out of nowhere to sell bonds to help out more organizations. Well, as you may recall, in March and April of 2020, it was a dire situation. Many nonprofits were really worried uh, all of the arts organizations, of course, were closing their doors. They, had, they weren't having programs. Any uh, arts organization or organization that did public programs and auditoriums and theaters and, and the such, uh, their, res their revenue just uh, evaporated. And in addition to that, we had the usual humanitarian organizations. And as you certainly saw in Houston, whether they're working on food banks or shelter or uh, helping people uh, from evictions, all of those sorts of things, that, that whole nonprofit community nationally, which literally represents hundreds of thousands of organizations, uh, was at risk. And so we wanted to respond 
But at the very time, our endowment, which is now $16 billion, was losing a lot of money because the market was volatile. So I um, proposed this idea of uh, selling a bond because basically the yield curve uh, was uh, so flat that uh, we could issue a 50-year bond and at literally 2.6% and just pay the debt on that, um, the service the debt on that, um, which is a totally manageable number, and have a billion dollars right away to give to nonprofits. So we doubled our giving to over a billion dollars last year and this year because of the bond and were able to give to everything from COVID relief and humanitarian efforts to racial justice organizations to the arts, as I just described. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really was amazing. And as I understand it, the bond sold out in an hour, give or take. Um, a couple of different concepts I want to kind of meld together here. Uh, you wrote a book called New Gospel of Wealth, From Generosity to Justice. So I want to hear how you kind of define those concepts. But you're also a gay black man who grew up in the South, which makes you a very rare breed in a very rarefied world of wealth and privilege. How has that background helped you uh, traverse the world that you're in? And what does being a 13-year-old busboy have to do with all that? Uh, you read the New York Times. I read a lot. You'd the, be amazed. Uh, the, uh, first, let me just say that um, the book that I wrote, uh, From Generosity to Justice, was inspired by the sort of dialectic between what I first learned at the Rockefeller Foundation, which was reading Andrew Carnegie's 1889 seminal essay called The Gospel of Wealth, which Rockefeller, Mellon, Ford, all the great industrialists used as their sort of game plan for their foundations. And in it, he discusses the, uh, the work of the philanthropist to give charitable uh, givings, alms, to help redress and, and, and the uh, deficiencies of the underclass, and, and, and there are words that were used that are almost offensive today, but were actually radical at the time for not only just the generosity, but his belief that rich people should give away their money. But I was inspired, yes, by that essay, but I was more inspired by something um, that was an obscure document that uh, Dr. King wrote in 1968, uh, shortly before he was murdered. And in it, he said the following about philanthropy. Philanthropy is commendable, but it should not allow the philanthropist to overlook the economic injustice which makes philanthropy necessary. And so what Dr. King was saying was something different than Carnegie said. Carnegie talked about charity, about generosity. Dr. King said the work of philanthropy should be about not just generosity and charity, but about dignity and justice. And that's a different idea of philanthropy, focused on justice. And so that was the inspiration for my book. And I was pleased that it did well and that um, we've had so much conversation uh, and are having conversation about the role of justice in philanthropy. For me, uh, you ask about the 13-year-old uh, busboy, the article uh, in the Times really, I think, reflected that experience of what it is like to be uh, a young black boy working in an all-white restaurant with an all-white staff where you are literally the lowest person. Uh, you clean the bathrooms. You bust the tables. You are invisible. Your very existence is rarely acknowledged. You walk around the room and you uh, do as much as you can to keep everyone comfortable and be invisible. And one of the things that I keep with me from that experience is what it feels like to be invisible and remind myself that that's who we're fighting for at the Ford Foundation people who feel invisible, who feel that they aren't heard, 
people who have a voice but aren't listened to, that our work is to elevate and support those people, to help ensure that they can live with dignity, that they don't have to live off of a wage that dehumanizes them and doesn't even recognize their humanity, that they don't have to live uh, with fear that they're going to be uh, treated unfairly in a criminal justice system that is biased against black and brown folks. And so that's our work. That's what inspires me and my own experience growing up and certainly being a 13-year-old busboy has certainly informed how I go about my work today. And what keeps you so grounded? Because you are living in a world of privilege now. You're legitimately part of that top 1%. How do you kind of hold on to that experience as a, as a young boy and use it to help others? I just think about, you know, sometimes we, uh, probably the three of us can talk about all of the complaints that we have um, as my mother often says to me, you know, boy, your problems are high class problems. You know, <laughs> talk to the hand. I mean, it's, it's, and I just think about all of the folks who have come before us. I know that Fannie Lou Hamer knew that in her lifetime, she would never see justice. Uh, Dr. King knew that in his lifetime, white America would not reckon with the reality of racism. Frederick Douglass knew that ultimately he would be not successful. And so I think about all of these people who came before us and I think about what their lives were like and yet they believed in this country, even when it didn't believe in them. There is no population of Americans more hopeful about this country than black Americans. We have believed in this country and have been the population who has most consistently fought for this country to live up to its obligations to all its citizens. And so that's what keeps me grounded. That's what demands that I be hopeful, that I be optimistic, uh, that I get up every day uh, and get to work and not wallow in whatever problem uh, I may be experiencing. Uh, because the problems that I experience uh, relative to the problems of the world are insignificant. And, and so that's how uh, I get up every day. And it, that's not to say I'm, you know, naive, but um, every day we got to suit up. You don't get a day off. And anybody who uh, is uh, in our positions knows that. To come back to the first thing I asked you about, when you said you got into that Head Start program, we went through public schools and felt like your country was cheering you on. How do you tell people now, or what do you say to people um, to keep them hopeful, especially young boys like you were? Well, I think it is really important that we uh, remind young people of their responsibility, obligation, and opportunity to do transformational things in this country. And we saw that last summer. I have never experienced the kind of mobilization of young people, certainly young black people, but also young white people and brown people but and old people, right? I mean, and so certainly living here in New York, what we saw um, was unprecedented. That gives me hope that uh, folks, young people today, continue to believe, but they are demanding accountability. They are demanding that things get better. And we should be supporting them 
in that effort. So, you know, I just did um, a, a commencement address. One of the things I do every May and June uh, are commencement addresses. And it's one of the reasons I do this, because if you want to be hopeful, go to a college campus. Yes, it can be contentious. It can be messy. But there are so many reasons for hope when you see young people at work today. And do you tell young kids you too can achieve on the level that I have? Not only do I tell them that, I tell them that you can do that without the constraints. So when I was growing up, and certainly in my career over the arc of it, you mentioned that I am black and gay and, and head of a major foundation. Uh, that was unthinkable probably t even 10 years ago. Um, and I think one of the things I say to young people is you can be all you want to be. You don't have to leave anything at the door. We were taught and interpolated from observing other black people who were successful often or other women who were successful, that you had to leave some part of who you are at the door when you walked in for that presentation, when you went into the interview, when you were being um, challenged in some way in a conference room about how you thought about a problem or a solution uh, for the company. You had to subordinate some part of you. Oh, well, I can't be too gay. I can't be too black. I can't be, I'm a woman, a black woman. I can't be too aggressive or I'll be an angry black woman. Well, you don't need, we shouldn't have to worry about that anymore. You can be who you are. If you are a gay woman, if you are a, a, a black woman with some sassiness, you can be that and still be a partner at the firm still be president, still be executive director, that these are within your reach and you can be authentically who you are. Uh, that is to me a reason for hope and it's absolutely something I tell to young people. And I find that they resonate. I mean, that they say, I've had on so many occasions, people come up after a commencement or people just send me notes saying, it means something that I see a black gay man at the helm of the second largest foundation in America. I am a 20 year old black Spelman sophomore and, and I'm gay and I have aspirations too. And it's good to know that I live in a country where hopefully like you, I can prevail and my talent will help take me as far as I want to go. This is part of the Juneteenth celebrations, of course, for Emancipation Park. As we honor Juneteenth and certainly uh, consider the legacy of systemic racism in this country, how do you help people around the country really celebrate this uh, monumental achievement, really talk about the importance of Juneteenth? Well, I want to really acknowledge that Texas has done a great service to this country because I was speaking with Annette Gordon-Reed, uh, the Harvard Law professor whose new book on Juneteenth is on the bestseller list. And Annette is from Con uh, Conroe and, uh, and Livingston. That's where her family held. And she and I were discussing this very thing. You know, growing up, we thought, you know, well, Juneteenth was something black folks in Texas, you know. All of a sudden, you got... Juneteenth celebrations on Martha's Vineyard. You've got Juneteenth celebrations in Chicago. And you've got Juneteenth becoming a national holiday. I mean, there are national companies that today uh, give Juneteenth as a holiday. Uh, we owe a debt of gratitude to the black Texans who initiated this effort to acknowledge and celebrate and it is a celebration. It is a time to celebrate, uh, to be joyous, to be happy, to look for fellowship. But it's also a time to reflect on how far we have yet to go and that the road ahead uh, is not a short road and that there will be some detours. 
but that we have to commit ourselves, recommit ourselves to the journey. So Texas has done um, this nation a great uh, service. And, and in fact, America is uh, indebted to the African-American community in Texas who ensured that this would be a state holiday. And from that vantage, uh, we have moved out now to this being a national movement. And of course, we're sitting here in Emancipation Park, a plot of land that was bought by Reverend Jack Yates and so many other leaders to celebrate emancipation every year, to celebrate Juneteenth, to make sure we did not forget that. So I want to make this kind of my last question. Your family still lives here in Houston. You grew up right in the shadow of the city. What are you proudest of when it comes to Houston and certainly uh, the Emancipation Park Conservancy as well? Well, let me say that what I'm proudest of is that this park exists because of the determination, grit, and relentlessness in the belief that Mr. Yates, the others, your father, all who have toiled in the fields without uh, accolades, without the trappings of wealth, but who believed that black people in Houston deserve dignity and deserve beauty and have persevered to bring a place of community, a place of fellowship and celebration that can give pride to the African-American community in Houston. And indeed, Houston itself, as a global city, I think has certainly overcome much of the reputation of some kind of a backwater uh, Hootersville with millions of people in it. That's not Houston. Houston is the most diverse, cosmopolitan, sophisticated city. And there is so much to be proud of there. And whenever I return to Houston, I'm reminded of that, not only the amazing cultural treasures of the city, um, the thriving business and educational infrastructure in that city, including the amazing Texas Southern University, but Houston, can teach us a lot about what is possible in this country. It can also teach us of the contradictions of this country. It is a microcosm of our aspirations and we need Houston to be Houston. We need this city to demonstrate that it is possible to have a successful multiracial democracy city in this country and that we can all learn from what you are doing in Houston. Well, Darren Walker, we are so proud of you and uh, the fact that you continue to call Houston home. Uh, we know your mom, your sisters, several of your family members are still here. And we're just so appreciative of all you have uh, done and to shine a light on this city, we really are. Uh, I wanna turn it back over to Ramon Manning who has been so patient. Uh, and Ramon, if you have any questions that I've overlooked, please jump in right now. But uh, I also just want to say a word of thanks on behalf of the whole city to Darren Walker and being a part, a major part of this Juneteenth celebration here at the Emancipation Park Conservancy. Ramon? Thank you, Mel. You know, I really don't have a question. However, I have a comment that I just really want to uh, highlight and reiterate that Darren made earlier just around philanthropy and, and, and thinking about philanthropy through a lens of investment uh, and not charity. You know, we in Houston here at Emancipation Park, um, we're so blessed and fortunate to have this gym and to really use this space and not your traditional green space park sense, but really take the utility of this space and service the needs of the community here in Third Ward in the greater Houston area. And I, ju I just would like to extend uh, our viewing audience um, uh, to really think about their philanthropy in an investment 
uh, capacity versus charitable giving. And uh, I want to thank Darren again uh, for being here. And we want to extend uh, uh, an invitation next year to our 150th year anniversary uh, to come on back home, Darren, and, uh, and fellowship with us and uh, celebrate our 150th year in Mel. Uh, I want to also recognize our local partners, um, uh, the Brown Foundation, Houston Endowment, Kinder Foundation, as well as our local community partners. Houston Museum of African American Culture, Project Row Houses, Third War Community Cloth, uh, and others. Without them, this would not be possible. Our programming exists because of our community partners, uh, and we're excited, Darren, and we look forward to developing a meaningful relationship with you and the Ford Foundation. Thank you. It's been a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. Thank you so much uh, to Darren. Thank you so much to Ramon, who really does the, the hard work every single day. And we hope everyone has a terrific Juneteenth.